Well, greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is Asij Malakias. I'm uh, co chairing this session with uh, my good friend, Salim Valimamade. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the Africa sessions. Uh, the main objective of this uh, virtual conferences is to foster analytical dialogue uh, between experts on critical and timely themes. The theme for this session is rethinking international relations after COVID-19. In six short months, COVID-19 has fundamentally challenged many of the assumptions that we normally took for granted. At the domestic level, the pandemic is stress testing the social contract in many countries around the world. At the international level, globalization is also being tested as even leading countries succumb to narrow nationalistic instincts. For most African countries, COVID-19 is a real reminder that the continent still faces challenges and vulnerabilities that will require deep strategic thinking and forward-leaning leadership. We have uh, invited a group of uh, very distinguished individuals to offer their perspective or their perspectives on the topic. Uh, and they are uh, Chris Alden, uh, he's a professor of international relations at the London School of Economics and Political Science and a research associate with the South African Institute of International Affairs. Uh, we have uh, Alexandria Arkansalskaya, uh, who is with the Center for Southern African Studies at the Russian Academy of Sciences. George Cardozo is a director of the Organ of Politics, Defense and Security Affairs at the Southern African Development Community, SADC. Bemba Dizolele is a lecturer at Johns Hopkins University's Paul Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies and a visiting fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. And uh, David Zwig is a professor emeritus at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He's also director of Transnational China Consulting Limited and vice president of the Center for China and Globalization in Beijing. This session will last about 90 minutes and will be moderated by two experienced journalists. Uh, Joel Carlos Costa of the Fonsan, uh, uh, newspaper in Angola and Shrikesh Laxmides uh, from the Jornal Economico in Portugal. So without any further ado, I will ask uh, Shrikesh and Joel to take over. Thank you. Thank you, my friend Asish, and welcome everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to moderate this very interesting panel. After the first remarks, we want to address the first round of questions. Uh, it's about global context. Uh, COVID-19 may likely be remembered both as a public health crisis and an event that may have marked the end of a global era in international relations, thus this being our inaugural topic. Indeed, globalization and more specifically cooperation among countries over a wide range of issues could, be, could become one of the COVID's biggest victims with increasing polarization, especially in a time of polarization between the United States and China. My first question is to a specialist on this area, uh, David Zweig. Hi, David. Thank you for being with us. My first question is, can you explain us the global context of this competition between the US and China and whether you see this competition uh, being, uh, uh, in, I would say, increased or becoming more fierce in the, as a result of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic? Hi, I'm sorry. We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, sorry. So, so um, yeah, I I see this as a uh, the global situation being one of a hegemon, the U.S. as a hegemon power, uh, 
facing a rising challenger, uh, being China. And I think that that creates the context uh, for, for this whole discussion, uh, at least at the strategic level. I think there are two caveats that I would like to add to that. Uh, maybe three. One is, of course, the question of whether this would lead to war. And um, uh, Graham Allison has a study on that, the, you know, whether the power transition leads to war. So that's one thing. Second point I would make is the idea that um, uh, what happens in the context of a rising challenger to a hegemon, is what I like to call the triangularization of most countries' foreign policy. So if you are a country in Africa, let's say, you've got two choices, uh, United States or China, and you have to deal with both of them. You have to figure it out. Very often you may go strategically with the US and now economically with China. Um, but most countries in the world face that kind of situation, uh, give or take some, some degree. Australia is a good example of that. My own country of Canada, those, we all have to play some kind of balance. And, and I think that that's very important. Um, and the third point I would raise, and this gets to the point of rethinking here on the COVID, post-COVID actually, and the extent to which COVID is uh, changing this structure, is the extent to which China is going, is or is not going to emerge uh, in a powerful position. Uh, China had, we can talk about this later, but China had some basic problems and it was hit, it has been hit really hard by the virus. And its economic uh, influence, I think, has been hurt. Uh, we can talk about Belt and Road. We can talk about its export, its ability to uh, take the exports or ex manufacturing, supply chains. All those things are problems for China. Uh, and that could have an important impact on the post-COVID world. Thank you, David. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, we will, uh, hi everyone, uh, would like to, would like to uh, call Vemba Dizolele. Uh, Vemba, do you see a growing polarization between China and the United States as a result of COVID-19? Uh, and the second question is, is China a threat to US geopolitical strategy? Uh, thank you very much, Joe. Um, it's a pleasure to join everybody today. Um, I'm Demba Dizolele. I will uh, be speaking in my personal capacity today, not uh, engaging uh, the university necessarily. Uh, do I see a growing polarization between China and the United States uh, as a result of COVID-19? Yes. And that polarization is not just with the United States, but that's also with other parts of the world. You know, traditionally, the U.S has been at loggerheads with China over ideology, over hegemony, uh, hegemonic uh, ambitions, as David just pointed out. But with COVID, a set of um, dynamics have emerged. One is the entire handling of the, of the COVID-19 itself, the outbreak by China. Uh, we're talking about geopolitics here. So within the context of Africa, uh, China, of course, did not give the world kind of the heads up. Right? So here is the different ideologies, the different way to handle, uh, to go about social contracts in the country, because this is what it comes down to. How do countries handle their, their crisis? And in this case, is one of, well, it's probably the largest uh, global crisis that we've seen in the sense that everybody is in this boat together. Maybe not together, but at least facing the same threat. And that threat is furthered uh, by, uh, depending on where you stand on the spectrum of this competition between the United States and China. Not everybody is trying to be an hegemon, but everybody is being affected by COVID. And the shock that that brings is, uh, is different depending on where you stand. If you are uh, Soto, if you are Kenya, if you are Burkina Faso, you're handling this differently. So whereby, whereas in the past you might have looked at China as a, as a, as a, as a partner, all of a sudden it makes you rethink your relationship with China. It makes you rethink your relationship with the United States. It makes you rethink your relationship with the West. And this does not just stick to Africa. We see this in Europe. If you are Italy, you rethink your relationship with China. If you are Norway, 
is quite as no <laughs> typically is you rethink your relationship with China. Uh, if you are Italy, you rethink your relationship with the European Union. Uh, we've seen that the European Union, is, if, from the Italian perspective, is not really available to, to help them when they were going through a tough time. So I think it's beyond the United States. I think uh, COVID-19 has pushed the limit for everyone to reconsider what model is good and what is not. And in this sense, I don't think it's um, one side win all in that um, the debate remains between autarky, uh, strong, strong uh, central government, dictatorship, and democracy. So it also raises the issue of fragility. What is fragility after all? Fragility is, uh, this is my definition, is how well you can absorb shocks. Uh, shocks that you are always beyond your own control and beyond your making. Traditionally, we've looked at uh, developing countries as the most fragile. And uh, we like to talk about the term resilience, a term that I actually do not like because it simply means how well you can take your suffering. Uh, fragility here, it shares that your social contract strong, your, your framework in your country. And this is what every single country has been tested on. In that sense, there's been an affirmative action when it comes to COVID-19. Every country has been challenged and every people, by that I mean the population of every country, is now questioning their own government and the efficiency thereof. So to go back, the, uh, the, the challenge between the, the fight, if we will, um, in quote, um, between the United States, the polarization will continue. But I think most, the more, uh, by, by and large, the world now is looking that this is also a world, the anarchical world where everybody fends for himself. Thank you. Thank you, Mbemba. And that takes us very nicely to our, our third question, which I will direct to Alexandra, who is in Moscow. Uh, good afternoon, Alexandra. Uh, the, my question to you is, how does Russia see these polarized responses, these polarized responses between, by China and United States to COVID-19? Is there a perception in Russia that the reputation of China and the United States in the world as leaders could be at risk and potentially an opportunity for Russia to step in? Or is Russia dealing with its own problems right now and has to look internally for now? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Shikesh, colleagues. Uh, I'm very proud to be the voice of Russia today. Um, but <laughs> let me first uh, thank the previous speakers for actually uh, putting on the table a very important, in my view, uh, view to the question. We live in a very interesting times now. Uh, all of the international order system Everything we knew is now under question. And it's not only the question about globalization and democracy and even values. It's the question we pose in our families being just closed in small apartments or in a big house together with the people we have to know closer. And it's the same applies to the nations, to the countries and globally to our partnerships with our other countries. And coming to the question about Russia, uh, what is her position uh, between China and USA? It's a very interesting question. And um, Mr. Lavrov, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs, gave an interview two days ago, and the same question was posed to him. So I think I'm obliged actually to read through what he was saying, and um, I will be much more um, to critique his views. We are on the side of justice, he says, and common sense. Justice presupposes that one cannot accuse someone of anything without proof. As of common sense, all forces should be directed not to shout, stop the thief, referring to China, but to unite and create a vaccine. There is a certain prestigious race who will be the first to actually find that vaccine. And there are a lot of manifestations of national selfishness. When the fight for who will be the first owner of the vaccine unfolds. So he points out to us that that is the new reality we live in. Now we're fighting for the vaccine. Uh, there are reports that the US 
um, the United States outbid the French firm Sanofi in the hope that it will be the first one to develop that vaccine and that will put the United States up front. And there are also a lot of suggestions that any result actually should be immediately become universal. Uh, they will be common sense without trying to extract geopolitical benefits. But we live in a world of reality and we know that the geopolitical benefits and how uh, the COVID is going to be unfolding and how the countries are going to play that card is very important now. And that puts us in the discussion about Africa and how are the external forces going to actually uh, be active and put the interest on the African continent that's more fragile uh, than any others. And I think that's the most important question. So Russia is standing in between uh, China and the uh, United States. And I think it's definitely going to, first of all, uh, watch into its own national interests. Um, you all know that uh, Russia is on the peak of the virus of the pandemic uh, losses. But for the last two days, we see the slight decline that gives us hope uh, that we're going to witness less uh, dead people from COVID. But as you mentioned, we're all in the same boat. Although we're in different views, but we're all fighting the same pandemic threat. Thanks. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Chris Alden. He's Professor of International Relations at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, Chris, uh, will COVID-19 affect the relations between African states and China? Uh, undoubtedly, as it will affect uh, the relations with other countries as well. I think that this is the, the point of departure that, that my colleagues and, and uh, Mvenda in particular uh, mentioned. I think that there's a kind of reconfiguration of the depth of, of commitment, uh, the, um, uh, the commercial, I, I think that the, the initial one will be a COVID-19 reaction, but I think that the, the, the more significant one will be the economic impact that follows in that, the debt crisis itself that will be exacerbated by the slowing economy and how China responds to that as, as a major player. I know this is playing on that old trope, which we're all familiar with about debt trap diplomacy. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying that the, the general inability of African economies that have been commodity based to respond to uh, uh, to be able to pay off uh, uh, interest on loans. They've already had a crisis talk with the G20. Their, their largest bilateral debt uh, holder, creditor, is China. China has been relatively silent in action terms on this. And this, you know, how it responds will be of great significance. So I think there's the short-term short COVID-19 uh, uh, set of reactions, which has, has varied. Uh, across different uh, for different domains uh, but I think that there's the, the the medium term reaction will be about how does China respond to the economic uh, um, troubles that uh, uh, flow from the COVID the slowing of the economy etc cetera, etc cetera. will China be as engaged will it respond to very specific concerns of African governments African uh, economies thank you Chris uh Staying with the African states and their economies, uh, the question, next question is for Georges Cardozo. George, welcome. Thank you for your presence. Uh, my question is, um, uh, the pandemic has shown that the entire international system is uh, vulnerable or has been weakened, not just African states. So in this sense, do you think that uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic will offer African countries some opportunities to reshape the priorities in terms of international relations, be it on the political, economic level and security level as well? Well, thank you so much for having me uh, into this very important platform, uh, sharing this uh, uh, with very illustrious colleagues. Uh, indeed, I, I think uh, the, 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 the moments which we are going through, uh, affected by the impact of the COVID, will definitely require uh, a more innovative ways for Africa to be a, a, a 
a, a key role player in international relations. However, I must stress that uh, uh, the ability of Africa to, 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 to be a, 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 an actor in the international, international system depends basically on two main issues. The one is, one is exo exogenous, which is the current geopolitical uh, 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 confrontation which we are witnessing uh, uh, between the US and, 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 and China, but also uh, it, will, it will always depend on, on its own uh, uh, structural weaknesses, uh, now referring to exogenous, uh, endogenous uh, um, challenges. Issues such as uh, poverty, uh, deviation, unemployment, uh, human security and human development, economic growth and good governance will, 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 will be key determinants on the ability of, of Africa to engage international, international uh, stakeholders. Now, definitely, uh, as Africa, we uh, uh, will we'll, we'll try as much as possible to have to build uh, uh, a sustainable relationship with the uh, international multilateral organizations. I'm talking, I'm referring to United Nations, uh, even international uh, uh, financial institutions such as the AIMF, or the World Bank, and so on. Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, looking, seeking at having a greater voice in those platforms, building also a political uh, and sustainable agenda with the G20, uh, uh, or seeking of attracting foreign uh, 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 investment. So those are the key contours which will shape the ability of Africa to uh, be able to uh, be a major key player in international relations. Uh, to, to, to conclude, um, as, I've, as I've been indicated by my, my colleagues earlier, uh, uh, this will require indeed a, a, some, some level of, uh, I would say, innovation on how uh, uh, countries in Africa will have to deal with the, with the competing interests and the polarization which we are witnessing uh, 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 between China and US. Uh, you, you will definitely uh, uh, understand that most of the countries in Africa, in particular Southern Africa, had, had, uh, had either partnerships or economic relationship with, the, with China and the US, and this increased polarization will definitely affect the ability of African states, of Africa at large, to be a key player in international relations. Thank you, George uh, Cardoso. Uh, we will now uh, go to the second topic. Um, some Asian countries' responses to COVID-19 have been applauded around the world, much to the displeasure of the Trump administration. Well, this, the first question of the second topic, version of responses, uh, goes to David Zweig, uh, is Professor Emeritus to the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. David, what are Asian countries doing right in response to COVID-19? And the second question is, has China's reputation deteriorated in African countries? Sure, so those are two, thank you, thank you. Uh, those are two separate questions. Um, I, as I sat down to try and think about some of this, uh, this question, um, it, it's amazing how many countries in East Asia have actually done, countries or go to territories, uh, have actually done pretty well. Um, uh, I lived in Hong Kong. I lived through SARS in 2003, which gave Hong Kong a strong sense of the need to really get control of this. Uh, and so Hong Kong, I think, historical experience has been very helpful. Um, in South Korea, uh, they reacted extremely quickly. I mean, the Americans, if you listen to the American media, they're constantly, they're challenging the Trump administration. They're constantly challenging them with data from South Korea, right? And the South Koreans have done you know, remarkably well. But even a place like Japan, uh, the, death, the numbers of deaths are not high. And so it's, it, one of the problems is to say, you know, is the early crackdown the tightening up, is that really important? And in the case of Japan, Japan has really not tightened up uh, by the central government. It has just asked people uh, to, to behave properly. And in that sense, it's worked. But most of the strategies, most of the successful places are, you know, cl closing, cl locking down and testing if they can. The South Koreans have done an enormous number of testing. Taiwan is a terrific example. Um, and you could even throw in here, just, just for 
for um, uh, conversations that you could even throw in China. I mean, China made mistakes in the early period. Uh, we could talk about that, though that's not the topic. But, you know, very serious lockdown. Uh, and uh, to a large extent was able to control it. Now, the Chinese play up the fact that their authoritarian regime is the one that has solved the problem. And uh, I think that that's just not true. I mean, theirs was one strategy. But if you look at Taiwan, uh, uh, they've done a terrific job. Uh, South Korea, these are all democracies. Uh, and uh, so it, it, it's not clear uh, which of the two strategies or which of the two systems. In that sense, we're talking, you know, China was very capable before this of saying, you know, the Chinese system is working. Africa was, a lot of African countries are saying, yeah, China's working really well, let's follow them. And then, and then here we've seen again uh, how democracies in East Asia, just look, well, you've got Vietnam, right? Vietnam's had almost no deaths. Right. So it's it's uh, and there's a much more authoritarian uh, regime. So that would answer the first question. Is that OK? Well, um, the second question then about uh, Sino-African relations, uh, I would preface it by saying I'm not a big specialist on on Africa, as I sort of told everybody. But uh, I think that there are several issues here. Chris uh, referred to them to a certain extent in terms of the debt issue. Uh, so how China manages the debt, uh, the African debt, and as Chris said, they have not been very outspoken, they've not been very forward. Uh, if you look at Deborah Brodigam's, uh, the, what's it called, the uh, China-Africa Research Initiative, there's a very good article on there that talks about uh, what does China do in terms of what are the myths and non-myths. Uh, and one of the myths that she may raises is they're not very good at giving up debt and that the debt that they do give up is usually the, the interest-free loans that are almost all done and then China will just say, okay, that's gone. What, what's created a problem for China uh, in the midst of this is the treatment of Africans uh, living in Guangzhou, uh, the, the tens of thousands of Africans living in Guangzhou and all of, you know, the, the throwing people, the local police uh, cracking down uh, very hard on the Africans living there. I've been, I, I live in Hong Kong, I go to Guangzhou all the time. I see, I see this community all the time and interact with it. Um, and uh, they've been throwing people out of hotels. Uh, this then raises a couple of issues. One is uh, it raises the long history, I think going back to the 1980s, even the 1970s, but clearly the 1980s, of a kind of racism uh, against Chinese, uh, African students in China. There have been numerous cases. Uh, I lived through one in Nanjing. Um, there have been numerous cases where there has been hostility between uh, the police in uh, China and the African students who are living and working in China. But this is the worst one, I think, uh, and it's related to the COVID. And, and the, what, what has really happened is that the African ambassadors or the African governments um, have called in Chinese ambassadors. They've gone public on this. They've used um, uh, United Organizations, African organizations, and publicly talked about this rather than doing this quiet diplomacy. Uh, and that's really, I think, quite shocking to the Chinese. And we've seen the Chinese take some very modern, take moderate statements. We haven't seen this kind of wolf warrior, sort of, we're really tough guys, you can't say this to us. Uh, the, the Chinese have been pretty apologetic uh, for what's happened in Guangzhou. Thank you, David. Uh, we, we will be sharing, just a note for the audience, uh, we will be sharing some tips such as uh, the research that David said on our, on our Facebook page after the event in the next few days, so stay tuned. Uh, Vemba, I have a question for you related to the first part of uh, David's answer, the models and the models of reaction. Where do, where do you think African countries need to be looking at uh, in the models to address COVID-19 now and in the future? Uh, we have the, these Asian, these various Asian country examples we have the slightly modeled model of the United States, or is there a third option? Do African states have the capacity or the need to pursue an independent path, a different path to uh, suitable for the particular requirements? Hey, uh, thank you very much, Rukesh. I think, um, you know, we're framing this discussion as if it's China and the United States. But I think that's also, we're missing a little bit of the point, especially when it comes to COVID-19. 
because it's a health crisis and different countries will handle it according to a, the realities of their own national borders. Um, they will look at what processes maybe that have worked in certain parts of the world. So what worked in Taiwan? How close is Taiwan to Mozambique? The realities of Taiwan and the realities of Mozambique, how close are they? Um, so is Taiwan really the best example, the best model for them to look at? Uh, sure, they can learn from Taiwan. Sure, they can learn from China. They can look at the United States. The United States has not been particularly the best model when it comes to COVID-19. So this is um, a situation where countries have really to rethink who, first of all, what are they trying to do? You know, we also are talking about this as if things were working fine and COVID came and then we have to find a way to solve COVID. I think Chris said it well. This is a temporary, quote unquote, maybe midterm, short term and midterm kind of crisis we need to handle with consequences that of obviously will be long term. But where did COVID-19 find Africa? COVID-19 find Africa in a democratization crisis with crisis of democratic institution. It found Africa in the middle of, in the middle of a crisis of migration and youth bulge. It found Africa in, a, in, a, in the midst of conflict and humanitarian crisis from Eastern Congo to Sahel to Central African Republic to South Sudan. It found Africa uh, in the midst of a rush, uh, kind of the new rush for Africa, where you have all the exogenous powers rushing for Africa. So if in Djibouti, you see China coming, you see Turkey, you see the Japanese trying to protect their, their interests going to Babel Manda, you see the French with the military base, you see the Americans. If you're in the Sahel, you see the same thing. You have uh, the, the, the tension between the Salafists and the Wahhabis, you have the jihadis and you have so on. So this is actually at the context of Africa. So for Africa, I think it's not just how do we engage China, how do they engage the US, it's how do they engage their own people. Um, technical advances now have also, we are on Zoom now. Uh, Africans are also on Zoom. Everybody's working on Zoom. So protests in the streets have been limited. The capacity of street protests have been limited, but the grievances are still there. Public discontent are still there. Africa is in the midst of a big rejuvenation of its youth movement. Again, from Burkina Faso to DRC to roads must fall in South Africa. I think those are the issues. So to me, I'll submit that this is a time for the Africans, for the Africans to start rethinking what are they trying to do, first of all. Are they going to be states uh, using the European model of states? We know African states do not, are not configured like European states. They have a different history. They're typically much bigger and much more diverse than any other states in other parts of the world. So to me, it's a chance to, to have a soul searching if such thing exists for a state, uh, definitely exists for a people, and to see what path are we gonna trail blaze going forward. Because um, again, I think what COVID has shown is that COVID-19 has shown is that in time of crisis, each state fends for itself. There's very little room for cooperation. Science and technology has always been kind of the boon of cooperation. There's never been disagreement on science and technology. The Wuhan lab had a lot of support from the US. You know, uh, SARS, H1N1, all those other things were dealt with within a collaborative effort. COVID-19 has spiked all the jingoism, nationalism, anything else in between. So does Africa, can Africa really afford to throw itself in that polarization? Uh, my answer would be no. Afri this is another wave, another opportunity for Africa to say, hey, who are we and what are we trying to achieve? So the models really are in many ways are irrelevant. Uh, the model that really will matter is, is the model that they come up with that face and reflect their reality, drawing from diff different experiences for, from other countries. But to put the U.S. as China, as, as the best model, Singapore may be the best model. Taiwan may be the best model. I don't know. I'm just saying this is the mindset that African, because Africans from the get-go, from the independence time, we're told you have to be with the East or with the West. You have to be, and that narrative has to stop. They, have, they don't have to be with either one of those. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vendan. Uh, the next question goes for Chris Alden. 
Uh, Chris, uh, what are the key strategic advantages that China offers to African states in their responses to COVID-19 and related challenges? Sorry, could, could you repeat the question one more time? Okay, yes, sure. Uh, Chris, uh, I would like to know what are the key strategic advantages that China offers to African states? in their responses to COVID-19 and related challenges? Yeah, the, the, the strategic advantage it offers to, uh, to African states is um, yes. uh, it, it has uh, delivered in a rapid, uh, after a slow start, it's ramped up its response quickly. It's been able to uh, provide in the context of engaging with Africa itself. I'm not talking models here, but how it's engaged with African states uh, uh, through the through the Jack uh, uh, Ma and Alibaba foundations. It's provided uh, distribution of masks, uh, ventilators, and various things like that. So there's a sort of largesse that's uh, available that has been able to to provide uh, uh, on pretty short notice to uh, African states. I think. At the same time, that uh, one of the the the, the um, uh, flaws, if you like, uh, uh, in the Chinese approach is sometimes on display in the sense that uh, some of the material that's been sent hasn't been up to standard and what have you, and it echoes a general problem we see with Chinese engagement in Africa that the the aspirational dimension is is quite. Uh, uh, high and lofty, and the ability of of, of the, the firms or the actors themselves is much more patchy in terms of their delivery. So I think that that, that has been one of the one of the um, um, it's sort of China undermining some of its own strategic advantage in this respect. So I do think that uh, having said all those things, that China has been once once it gathers its forces in this area, it's worked pretty hard to to uh, make, uh, to, to bring to Africa some of the resources necessary to fight the disease quickly, uh, rapidly, and, and effectively. Thank you, Chris. Uh, from China to the BRICS, Alexander, uh, we have had, um, over the last 10 years, we've seen um, the development, the emergence of this group of uh, five uh, emerging countries. Uh, and one of the focuses was Africa from the beginning. Uh, how do you think this, uh, this pandemic gives an opportunity to, for the BRICS to fit in? Uh, will, the, will the pandemic help cement or increase its influence on the continent, do you think? Uh, it's a very interesting question and I think it's a very important one as well. Uh, COVID-19 shows that it is a new challenge to the existing world and BRICS is the probable new response because uh, we are witnessing the need for new responses. The world we knew is not working, uh, so we need new responses and maybe BRICS is one of the ways to respond to it. Uh, I would agree with Mvemba that uh, countries are actually looking closer to their national interests and Russia is presiding BRICS this year so we're looking forward to how BRICS is going to evolve around this crisis um, but regarding Africa I think uh, a very important question that Chris brought to the table is uh, the signing off of debts to African countries and Russia did sign off the debts last year before the first Russia-Africa summit. Uh, it's a big step forward. But of course, when we speak about BRICS and we speak about the new model, um, the question that arises is China again. Uh, others, four others, are going to be uh, the ones restraining China from being uh, manipulative and being predominant on the African continent. Or is it a flexible cooperation. There's a lot of questions about the BRICS, but maybe BRICS could be one of the instruments towards the science and technology response as well, uh, because there's a lot of cooperation going around science and technology. 
uh, BRICS is not a military alliance that gives it a flexibility to solve some of the security issues, such as a lot of problems uh, around the African continent uh, with agriculture and uh, health as well. If you read the communiques of BRICS in the last two or three years, you would see that BRICS did already discuss the health security issues. And even COVID was there on the, on the lines but uh, the world was not ready to find that response. So I'm putting a lot of hope on the BRICS and I think they do fit into the African continent because all of the five countries have their history on the continent and some of the history is uh, very positive, some of the, qu of the history is questionable, but uh, if you actually regard it not as a bilateral cooperation with the continent, with the countries of the continent, but trilateral or multilateral, that could be one of the frameworks in which uh, some of the help to the developing African states, the young continent, could be held. Thank you, Alessandra. Uh, before uh, addressing the next question, uh, I will just uh, say hi to Anthony one of the, uh, our uh, listeners. Anthony, we saw your question and we will address it to the panel uh, when the time is right. I mean, at, in the end, we will have time to some questions from the panel and some uh, that were addressed for some people before. But by now, we will uh, keep and move on to the questions and, and to the panel. Uh, and I will address the next question to George Cardozo. Uh, George, uh, is COVID-19 one more reminder that Africa needs a Marshall Plan or bailout? Uh, well, uh, definitely not a Marshall Plan as we traditionally have known it. Uh, that, that to me is a bonus tale. Uh, uh, and and what I believe Africa needs is it's, it's a blueprint for development, is a master plan which will uh, uh, prioritize key issues such, such as um, industrialization, uh, uh, infrastructure development, um, econ economic diversification, and value chains. Uh, uh, value chain being key. Uh, to, to enable a, a, a product beneficiation into key strategic commodities, which, I mean, are everywhere in Africa. Uh, and the, now, the challenge may be how should we uh, uh, mobilize resources to fund the African development, developmental needs. I think the African Union has, a, has already laid down uh, the, the plan, with, with, which is called uh, uh, um, the, the 2063 African Union agenda, where I mean the aspirations of Africa uh, are, are all uh, reflected in terms of uh, its uh, its goals and its objectives. Now, uh, resource mobilization uh, uh, is key. I, here, to me, I believe uh, Africans and Africa should be on the forefront, as we have uh, 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 as we have. Uh, uh, potential uh, enormous in terms of uh, uh, natural resources to fund the, 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 these needs. Let me just remind, for instance, that uh, Botswana uh, and uh, the DRC, uh, together with Russia, uh, account for 8% of the uh, global uh, diamond reserves. Uh, Angola and Nigeria uh, are, are the leaders in Africa in terms of the uh, 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 output of, of oil production, more than 50%. We, we do have also the case of Mozambique with the enormous, enormous potential in terms of uh, natural gas. So we, did, we, we, we indeed have uh, all the necessary conditions for us to be able to fund uh, our own development. And then, of course, partner with the international organizations, with the cooperating partners to fill in the gap where it is required. Now, uh, the issue of the, the bailout, I mean, uh, uh, David has, has referred to it. Uh, the issue of the, uh, uh, um, it has been actually uh, requested by the African Union uh, in April, whereby one of the pledges was that uh, uh, either the, the international uh, uh, financial institutions or the major 
uh, uh, partners be able to uh, uh, waive the service of, of the debt. That is, that is eventually one of the uh, ways to go, and I think we should rally uh, uh, together as Africans and engage uh, uh, the major partners and, 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 and seek that wave, or if possible, a total relief, at least of the uh, uh, service of, of the debt. Uh, that will enable us to uh, uh, channel uh, key uh, resources to fund the development needs of Africa. Thank you, George. Thank you very much, George. We've now reached the third round of our, of our session, um, and this, uh, this round is about the path ahead. Uh, so the COVID-19 crisis will have a, a multiple impact on political risks worldwide in various regions, and most of them with some kind of impact on, on Africa, in African countries. Uh, these, obviously, these risks uh, are dependent on how, how quickly uh, the crisis is contained or whether it persists for many more months. Uh, the one we've been speaking about China and its massive influence in Africa, including in, on debt, which is the last point you touched. So I want to start to, with a question for David. David, the, the economic crisis that the pandemic has posed to China uh, will some stress, um, stress test the country's social culture. Can the Chinese government remain stable under the conditions of quite severe social and economic dislocation? And will it continue to have economic power to measure influence in Africa? One is um, that uh, China is having a real problem fulfilling its social contract because its social contract in the past was we will continue to have your economy grow, we will build a middle class, we'll give you cars, we'll let your housing improve, you know, we'll let you travel and have a really nice life, just don't mess with us politically. Uh, and that's a hard one to fulfill right now. 20% uh, unemployment people are talking about. Uh, youth would be very disgruntled, the young people who have had a terrific time uh, over the last 15 years. I mean, you know, I, I teach Chinese uh, middle class students who come down to Hong Kong. Uh, you know, they're having a good time. They're running companies. They're, they're you know, life has been really good. And, and so all of this instability that people have talked about in China and people, political science love to talk about the in, political instability. I, I just haven't seen it. And, and I think that, um, uh, but now COVID then creates that problem. Um, but one positive side to the social contract is that China can make the case and C can make the case that they've handled the crisis pretty well as long as they uh, control the information about the extent to which China and local governments and Xi and, you know, that why did they not respond very quickly for the first 20, 25 days, uh, if they can control that narrative and just emphasize the fact that, look, the world, you know, we're not Italy, you know, we're not the US. I mean, you know, Trump has been a disaster from my view uh, on this. It's easy to make that case. Uh, and the Chinese have made that case. So on that side of the social contract, I think they've done okay, or at least they have a chance to get out of the problem. Now on the stability issue, again, we've had two views on China being stable. There's a very popular view. A lot of Westerners, again, uh, love to say that, boy, she's always in trouble. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, that this, this crisis is going to be his... Uh, undoing. I mean, this is a country that in 19, uh, 1990, uh, let's say 1992 or 1994 to 2000, laid off 65 million people. Uh, and, and the country survived, the party survived quite well. So in that sense, I often vote for the stability side, that despite the problems that could exist, uh, the, the party, it's, it's, it's security infrastructure, uh, its ability to monitor its citizens, and uh, a certain degree of popular support uh, 
that that this is not such an unstable uh, uh, situation. But but there really is a you know you can make the case that the that the social tensions are there. Uh, if the economy does not improve fairly quickly, that will have both domestic and international implications. Uh, the domestic clearly would be uh, that it could threaten the, the Communist Party, though again, as I said, I think that the state in China is, is pretty strong. Um, and internationally, I wanted to go back because I didn't uh, make the final point in, the, uh, in my first uh, conversation about the whole question of power transition. Um, you know, China just may not quite make it. And if it doesn't quite make it, we all want to think about what kind of China are we going to see if they don't reach Xi Jinping's China dream, uh, if they don't attain some of the goals that they've really, you know, belt and road and all these things. How is China going to respond? Is it going to be very prickly? Uh, or is it going to uh, work its way through those problems? Uh, my own sense is that, I mean, the Chinese themselves have written a domestic uh, document uh, from one of its think tanks that says that they're in big trouble internationally. There's, the world is as hostile to them as uh, it, ever since Tiananmen, uh, and that there's the real threat uh, of war. I would add one point, though. Uh, uh, do I have one second to add one point? Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, on the Russia thing, one thing we haven't mentioned, uh, uh, I think that uh, Russia-China is a very interesting phenomenon and very important, especially if you use the power transition or the hegemon challenger model, because if you are the rising challenger, China, and you need some support and some protection before, to make sure that the United States doesn't go at you, the natural ally is Russia. And so from a strategic perspective, and, and we've seen, I think, pretty good relationship. And I don't think it's a relationship of convenience, which again is what the Westerners often say. And, and uh, Alexander can, can talk about that. I think that this Russian-Chinese relation is pretty good. Uh, and therefore moving forward, I think those two will be, you know, they'll find a way to work together. But again, um, we could see the United States in the long term just maintain its dominance. Um, one really interesting statistic, and I'll stop there, is if you look at share of GDP uh, uh, after uh, before the uh, East Asia, the global financial crisis, the United States was 25% of the global GDP, and then after the crisis in 2007 2008, it dropped down to 20% of GDP. Well, it's back to 25% again. Um, China continues to grow; it's about 17% of global GDP. But you know, the United States is not terribly on decline. Um, and so going forward, I think this will be uh, very interesting to see if China can maintain how, how badly it will be hurt by the, 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 the virus. And, and anyway, I'll stop there. You can see that. You can also see that in, on the, in the weight of the dollar, which is supposed to decline, but it's not, it hasn't declined as a world currency. Joel, next question. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you, Sheik. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, David, uh, and the next question goes to November. November, does COVID-19 represent a moral threat to global American influence, or is it an opportunity for the United States to reassert its power? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joel. Um, you know, um, a good country, a good politician never let uh, a good crisis go to waste, right? That's... Uh, that's what uh, the motto is, and that's what uh, typically tends to work. So a mortal threat, no. I don't think it is a mortal threat. I mean, uh, it would have been a mortal threat if it affected only the United States. Again, this is a global pandemic. Everybody is going to come out of it a bit weakened, a bit battered. Uh, I, I cannot imagine a country that will come out of this very strong or stronger than they were before. Uh, having said that, the United States still has the wherewithal, it still has the means, it still has the standing uh, that will work to its, its favor, that's on the side of its asset. The challenge with the United States is the leadership. Uh, you know, your, your influence is, is not so much your means, it's about your leadership and what you do with it, what you do with the means. So in this case, I think uh, the Trump administration has taken a certain stand, a certain posture, over the last three years that we're all very familiar with. Uh, Make America Great Again, America First. 
uh, within those conditions, it's very difficult then to lead. Uh, because if you're, you're projecting that it's only you and everybody needs to follow you and the interests of others are not as clear, at least to you or to them, or so in the best uh, scenario, it's secondary to yours, uh, it becomes very difficult to lead, uh, at least to build the coalitions that the U.S. is known to build, whether it's with Europe, whether it's with other countries. So this will be interesting to see, for instance, uh, the administration announced that uh, they are on a race now to find a cure or a vaccine. The issue of vaccine, finding the vaccine or discovery of the vaccine, whatever the term will be, is very interesting and very relevant to this question. Um, is this vaccine exercise a collaborative one where data and, and protection and other protocol will be followed? Or is this going to pan out in the way that the Americans do their thing, the French do their things, and so on and so forth? Or is it going to be a situation whereby uh, we revert to what we've done in the past? So the WHO is one space where we see this come to play. Uh, the US, with all its might, um, if I can use that word, has decided to suspend its funding. That is not particularly an interesting way, if you were to ask me, to, to convene that leadership and to bring influence. It is also one of those areas where we've seen the early question that you had asked me about polarization. One area where we've seen that one arena has been the WHO, because it's not just polarized the US, a greater polarization between the US and China, but even the leadership of the WHO now is being scrutinized within that lens. And that's not particularly the best way to do these things. We saw that that polarization also led to certain voices not being to the, to the fore of, of the discussion. So voices like Taiwan uh, would have been very important in that discussion. But because of the configuration of the WHO and the discussion that we're having now, that's, that's a problem. Um, what will it mean in terms of uh, as countries uh, start dealing with the economic, uh, the economic downfalls, if you will, uh, of, of uh, COVID-19? How much is the U.S. willing to, to extend its, its hand of help? Uh, is it going to be mostly just humanitarian, which is not what countries will need? Uh, since we're in the geopolitical realm here, how does the U.S. engage other parts of the world like Africa, for instance? You know, Africa, uh, the problem with Africa, I think one of the problems is the world has continued to look at Africa through a humanitarian lens. Uh, the U.S. has an opportunity, like other countries. China has chosen its own path through Africa. We've discussed that in many ways. Um, the U.S. has struggled with its engagement with Africa. And if the, if the U.S. is supposed to, is, is determined to maintain its leadership, one area that is readily available to engage is the African continent. So mortal threats? No, I don't think so. Um, opportunities? Yes. Is that feasible? Yes. Is it going to happen? It depends on what the leadership, the current leadership in Washington will do and how much they can be visionary in engaging the rest of the world. I'm a bit pessimistic in that sense, but let's see. Thank you. Thank you, Mbemba. Um, Alexandra, I want to take this opportunity to ask you to comment on, on uh, David's uh, answer just a few minutes ago. Uh, we were talking about BRICS. Uh, it's very interesting to see uh, from your point of view what, how you see the, the relationship between Russia and China at the moment and how, can, how it can go forward in this time of polarization. The second part of the question, which was my original uh, question, is um, we're talking about the BRICS. What role could there be for the BRICS development bank at this stage? You know, development uh, has been put at pause in a certain sense in Africa because of this pandemic in some countries and will be, will be one, of the key, one of the key tests. So can the BRICS Development Bank help in this, in this front? Uh, thank you for the question, David. Um, well, as a political analyst, I want to see how this is going to be evolving uh, about Russia-China dialogue. Uh, it's evident that uh, there is a good ground for that relationship. Russia being under a lot of sanctions is in need recently 
for recent few years, in need for new partnerships and reviewing and rethinking its partnerships. That's why in the Russian forest policy, China is playing much more uh, prioritized role than it did play before. Uh, and BRICS as well. We see a lot of uh, interest towards BRICS in relations with China and BRICS as the grouping. Uh, of course, there is a lot of questions as well because Russia does have a lot of territory, China has a lot of people, and there is uh, still a lot of uh, very picky questions between Russia and Chinese relationships. So I think it's going to be uh, a very nice and long dance being two of the civilizations trying to find their own way forward. But yes, um, I think if we regard it in the polarized world between China and states, uh, Russia is probably going to go to dancing with China and will try to make her partner be uh, more evident and more joyful uh, in the current circumstances and finding other alternatives to the bipolar world and trying to play its new role with facing a lot of economical problems, as you all know. Uh, and coming back to Africa, because I think we're discussing Africa today and it's very important uh, because Africa is a young and growing continent. We've Africa is very, very young. And I think the whole world understands the potential and the perspective of the African continent as a whole. So um, I think all of the leading states are going to be very cautious and use the geopolitical, um, its geopolitical means after COVID-19 to actually find the new ground on the continent. And Africa is not new apart from other parts of the world. Africa is uh, that continent that is not new to pandemic uh, consequences. Ebola was not so long ago and Africa has a lot of uh, responses towards such threats. And we're forgetting about that, that maybe we should actually change our perspective and learn something from African states and African responses. Because now we're discussing a lot about what uh, Asian countries do in response what America, Russia, China is doing, but you're not actually thinking about how African countries are actually reacting to that threat. And I think uh, another emphasis I want to put on the table is that maybe we should change the rhetoric of uh, seeker and giver. And uh, because we always regard Africa as a seeker and others as givers, but I think the time has changed and uh, it is time for partnership and Africa can help other states as well. And in that regard, uh, the BRICS Development Bank is of course a small initiative, but with a big potential. Uh, what did it already done? It did help China with 1 billion and it did help uh, on the 3rd of May, it was announced that uh, they already uh, gave 1 billion towards India to help fight the pandemic. And there are two pending questions from Brazil and South Africa. And uh, it was announced that 10 billion is going to be given. So there's obviously 1 billion to be given to South Africa, representing African continent and 1 billion to Brazil. So I think there's a lot of potential, but we should understand that BRICS is very flexible. It's very undetermined. It doesn't have a rigid structure. That is probably an opportunity, but it's also difficulty. It's always difficult to find uh, common ground for two countries, but imagine for five. So, uh, and if the other view towards the BRICS development is that all of the countries in the BRICS are very fragile. We're speaking about vulnerability and fragility today. All of the countries, mainly uh, China is not the one discussed, but all of the four others are really suffering uh, and are going to experience a severe economic crisis after COVID-19. So that framework is probably uh, the one with potential, but the same as the first question, I'm uh, really keen to see how it's going to work. 
but let's see. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, the next question goes to George Cardoso. George, what measure uh, must be in place to ensure that the COVID-19 pandemic does not negatively affect the positive political gains made in Africa over the last few years? In, in uh, referring that as, as Africans and Africa, we also have a, a good uh, range of uh, experience in dealing with the pandemic. The, the, the example of Ebola, uh, but also as of today, let me share with you this. Uh, as of today, uh, we are the least uh, affected uh, or the second least affected region of the world after Oceania. Oceania. Uh, we have 80,000 uh, uh, infections, around plus 80,000 infections, and 2,600 uh, uh, um, casualties death. Uh, countries such as Mauritius today have, been, have, been not, have not registered any cases for the past two weeks, so almost in the verge of considering uh, COVID-free. Uh, we, we, have, we, have had, we have Lesotho, which unfortunately, uh, two days ago, have registered its, its first, first case of, of COVID. Uh, so it was, uh, I would say, that the last African country to be, to be affected. Uh, so we do have, uh, uh, and let me also give you the example of Madagascar. Uh, Madagascar currently, uh, they're, 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 they're spearheaded by the president of Madagascar. They have been using a, what, they, what is called COVID organics uh, uh, coming out uh, of uh, Tunisia, and it seems to be uh, effective because uh, no deaths have been registered in Madagascar, and uh, the rate of, of, of recovery in Madagascar since the, the, the use of, of these COVID organics seem, seem to be uh, paying off. And uh, I, I, I'm sure uh, the government in Madagascar is also now going through the required uh, testing uh, uh, to, to prove uh, that eventually that combination uh, can be uh, effective in, in, in if, not, if not curing, but at least to, to, to mitigate contamination in Africa. So I think we, we, have, we have demonstrated uh, to, 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 to be able to, to deal uh, with the pandemics in a very effective way. The governments were very uh, uh, from the first um, uh, cases which have been registered in the continent, uh, they were very active in, in adopting the WHO recommendations uh, uh, in, 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 in containing, but also in identifying and testing cases. Uh, uh, most of our, of our countries in Africa have imposed partial or full lockdowns and declared state of emergencies. Uh, uh, so in order to, to contain the spread of, uh, of, of the COVID. Uh, we have also seen, I mean, one of the positive aspects of the COVID, we have also, also seen uh, a great deal of investment in, in public health uh, facilities, uh, which is something which uh, uh, over the years uh, uh, has been a, a huge challenge. So there is uh, uh, this very positive aspect, which I, I do hope, it will be sustainable. Uh, now, uh, I doubt if we will we'll definitely be able to avoid the, the negative impact of the COVID. What, what as Africans we have to do is to, is to continue investing in, 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 in public goods, in, in, in public, uh, continue, continue making uh, investment, um, in public investments, very strong public investments in infrastructure, for instance. And eventually, one of the lessons to me again which this pandemic uh, uh, is showing is that here uh, the, the, the state is, is again playing a central role. In as much as we, we, uh, we are seeing, I mean, a uh, whole uh, uh, range of stakeholders, the private sector and communities also having a key role and civil society organizations having a key role in, 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 in fighting the, the pandemic. But the, 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 the state has, I would say, recovered the central role in providing for essential essential goods. Uh, uh, we may be eventually returning to that concept of development states, which were very successfully applied 
in the, in the 60s and 70s in some Asian countries. So I do believe that uh, what is key, and in order for us to be able to uh, positively respond and, and, and try as much as possible to minimize the effects of the pandemic, which by the way, uh, 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 we have been, uh, since the, the crisis, financial crisis of 2008, and later on, the, 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 since 2014, the, 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 the lowering of the main uh, commodity price in the national market uh, have, of course, have had a, a, a very uh, um, uh, dire effect in, in the downturn of the economies in Africa. So I would say that pandemics, this pandemic only came to uncover and expose to a great extent the fragilities of many countries but also in Africa. So the best way uh, which we can, we can try to mitigate the effects of the pandemic is to be able, for instance, to, to, to uh, absorb external shocks, uh, given to the fact that we are mainly economies which rely on the exports of commodities. Uh, but also, uh, uh, let's not forget, I mean, we do have all, all other existential threats. Uh, climate change is there, I mean, uh, Africa, in, in particular, Southern Africa is very prone to the effects of climate change. So adaptation to climate change is also key. We do have a, a, a second call, uh, uh, manifestations of drought and, 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 and floods. Let's not forget, the, for instance, the, 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 the heavy rains uh, in Mozambique last year with hurricanes uh, Kenneth and the six cyclone Idai. So, I mean, uh, 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 it must be a combination of, of policies uh, uh, which then have to be successfully implemented in order to uh, assist uh, uh, Africa in mitigating the impact of the COVID. Thank you, George. We're now uh, reaching towards the end of our first Africa session. Uh, we have a final round of about 10 minutes. Uh, in this final part of the session, we have with us, uh, we're going to pose a couple of questions that have been submitted previously by some of our partners. Um, the first is from uh, Francisco da Cruz, who is Angola's representative at the African Union. And I'd like to direct this uh, question to, to Chris, Chris Alden. How should we prepare to respond to peace and security challenges arising from the COVID-19 pandemic in the context of, of the operalization of the African peace and security architecture? I think that the, the responses are, are not going to be any different. The first uh, uh, manifestation that I, I tend to think of uh, post uh, or current to COVID-19 is what we're seeing in Cabo Delgado and in uh, northern Mozambique. And we see uh, the rise of, of um, uh, a serious, what had been a festering peace and security problem over a number of, of years turn into an outright uh, challenge to state authority there and jeopardize the very economic wherewithal of, of uh, uh, Mozambique's uh, aspirations to, to, in the national gas, to trans transform the national gas sector into um, it, its, uh, you know, its leading uh, economic um, source of, of, of growth. So I think that the challenges in, in some respects are the same, that where, where they are largely the same, but they will have been challenges basically to the to uh, governments which have not been able, in the context of COVID-19, to um, extend their authority across uh, already disputed regions. So I think that the the, the peace and security architecture, the the, the relationship between the AU um, and the UN Security Council. Uh, the, this remains at the heart of responses to, to challenges of this nature to, uh, um, to African peace and security. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chris. Don't go away, because I think I'm gonna direct the second question to you as well. Second question is from Ricardo Ferreira, who is board member of Standard Bank in Angola, to which I'm gonna add a touch of part of my question as well. Now, the question is, how can African governments in an environment of uh, debt debt stress in a sense that uh, revenues are down uh, from, um, from natural resources, looking at Angola's case, for example, from oil and others. Um, how can these governments maintain actions to improve, continue improving the business environment and, for example, allowing foreign direct investment to come in? 
I think that many of the, the governments are already doing the right thing. The problem is not with the African governments and the incentive structures, but rather the, the attitudes uh, towards risk and, and, uh, uh, and other and, and, uh, inabilities to see opportunity uh, in African markets. Um, I, I, if I could flip it actually slightly and say the thing that I find uh, continually distressing is that uh, Africa's uh, ability to uh, to access markets, uh, be they uh, European Union, be it uh, China, be it the United States, still remains uh, uh, circumscribed. It's it's limited, um, and I think that governments that really want to see African business grow, uh, and indeed could invest in Africa, as as we see little in we see small examples of that in places like uh, East East Africa, Ethiopia, and what have you, could then use these as um, uh, greater market access uh, for, for goods produced in Africa, for agricultural products uh, grown in Africa and exported would, would make a tremendous difference to growing the business environment. So I think that we can't wait for uh, investors to change their mind. I think that the investing, the, the countries from which they uh, arise can can reframe their imp their uh, their um, the access that African uh, goods have to to uh, their own markets. Thank you, Chris. Before we go on to to final remarks, I uh, would like to just pose one question that has been uh, uh, submitted in the chat room of this session. It's from somebody called Anthony, uh, and the question is: I'll leave it open to the panel. Uh, whoever would like to respond. It's a big question. How will COVID-19 impact on the logic of regional integration in Africa? Any volunteers? Alexander, go for it. Uh, I can answer that. I think we already see the impact. Uh, it is already playing a very important role. It is delaying the integration. And I think COVID-19 is actually playing uh, the cards with us, the global world. I mean, we do experience uh, nice outcomes as this uh, concrete session. It is a globalized world and we cannot say it's not because we, today, we are all present from all different parts of the world, different countries, and we can discuss the outcomes of the pandemic. Uh, but the other part is that actually it has a bad outcome as well. The integration is going to be delayed. And as we discussed today, I think it's a very important question. And thank you for that. Uh, because Africa was showing a very good example to the whole world. And the regional economic cooperation is an outstanding actually initiative and integration initiatives that the whole world was waiting. But now because of the pandemic, we're going to see the back step towards national interest closing to the national borders. And of course, I think that the pace of the integration in Africa is going to be much more slower than it was expected before. Thank you, Alexander. Any further comments from any of the panel members on this aspect? George, go for it. Yes. Now, just to say uh, uh, that um, I think m m more than ever, uh, integration uh, has become uh, relevant uh, because, they, they, I mean, in as much as uh, countries are responding to, to the pandemic with, uh, with measures from the national point of view, I mean, in a very individualistic point of view, at, at, one, at some stage, uh, that response will have to be coordinated. Let me give you a practical example. Uh, 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 here in Southern Africa, uh, if, 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 South, South, if South Africa decides to, 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 to lower the, 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 the level of, of restriction of the lockdown from level four to level three, or even to level two, to level two other countries uh, 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 also will, will, will also have to uh, adopt or at least to reach a stage where similar measures can be adopted. So, and this, this can only happen if there is coordination and there is consultation and there is convergence of, of action uh, 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 among, uh, uh, among countries. Another aspect is, I mean, more than ever, uh, uh, multilateralism is being challenged. We have been seeing the attacks uh, against the WHO uh, 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 in, the, in the extent that uh, countries are, are really uh, fending for themselves. 
So the whole logic of, of coordination, of coming together, of solidarity, which uh, the regional economic communities uh, allow to countries, it's very key in responding to, to, to the COVID. Thank you, George. And uh, we are uh, uh, coming to the end of our session. I don't know if uh, anyone of you have any further comment for the question that she uh, has uh, submitted before. But in case uh, every, we're done about this question, uh, it's just time to thank you all for your presence and for the participation in this, that is the first initiative of the African sections. And I will uh, call Salim Valim Ahmad, one of our, um, uh, I, I don't know if I call his sponsor, November. but Salim, you can move forward. I think Mvemba wants to take a note, please. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, George and Salim. I just want to say, uh, you know, the um, question was about Rex. Um, the future of integration in Africa is at the REC level, not at the AU. Uh, the AU, in my personal view, should be disbanded. Uh, it's not worked. Uh, we should go to the REC uh, level and start consolidating. And in fact, uh, ECOWAS is one of the RECs, probably the only RECs that really is functioning as close as uh, the population can have. They have implemented measures over the years, common passports, uh, traveling without visa, uh, adherence and commitment to the charter of the organization, namely with democracy. We've seen the influence of, of ECOWAS in the Gambia, in Burkina Faso, in Niger and other places. So I think that's where we need. This is a function of the sizes of uh, African countries. It's not a function, 54 countries trying to run a, a, an organization. Uh, when you have problems at home, it's kind of very complicated. But the recs, I think, are, are a good place to start. So COVID will affect that, but we can see also how ECOWAS is dealing with its, uh, its COVID uh, situation. Every day they publish the results. You can track every single day what the cases are with the situation, how the situation is unfolding in all the ECOWAS spaces. So I just want to, to throw that out there. I think it's very important because we tend to look at AU and the AU just not delivering. Thank you. Thank you, Vemba. Uh, well, uh, in case we don't have any other comments, I will go to Salim. Many thanks, Joel. And uh, it was a very rich discussion here we have. To, thanks to the member of panels very excellent interventions here and i want to appreciate all the participation of you each of you excellent thank you very much as asis was telling uh, in the beginning uh, this platform uh, global strategy has the aim to promote this kind of discussion especially in the in the fields that is a current challenge uh, uh, namely to african countries so as you can see in this debate there are many challenges for, uh, in terms of African countries, in terms of politics, in terms of economics, in terms of social issues. So I, I believe this debate was very, very rich to give some contributions to the policymakers. Thank you very much to all of you. See you next time. Thank you.